Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to day two of China Market Entry 2022. I just want to highlight here, it's 2022, 2023, okay? Um, because I know a lot of people might not exactly add China as part of their expansion strategy into their 2022 budgets. Um, so it could very well be that it goes into their 20, 2023 budgets. But obviously, the big question is to go or not to go. Yesterday, uh, Manfred and I were discussing about market research, market opportunity, uh, looking at data, data, data. And we'll reflect a little bit on that during our discussion point um, later on as well. Manfred, if you just want to pop in and say hi <laughs> before we go. Hi, everybody. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for being back today. I just wrote a message on the chat as well. Um, looking forward to be back with, with everybody and kind of diving into the financials and, and our perspective on that one. Wonderful. So today is a bit of a deep dive. There might be terms and terminology that some of you aren't aware of. If there is something you don't understand or you've got a question on, raise your hand. Uh, Manfred is the moderator for today, so he's going to be checking the chat box and, and checking everyone's comments um, and popping in here and there as well um, if anything does come up. But today we're talking about business models and the financial resources that are that are needed. All right. So let's get cracking on the education side. So in terms of business models, all right. Now I, I have actually delved into each of these items in separate webinars. And if you are interested in taking a look at those webinars, please go to Woodburn's YouTube channel. They're all posted there, okay? But we only have 60 minutes today and I need to give you an overview of what is available Right? What can you and can you not do when you go into China? So option one is the starting point. And this is where everybody starts. It's where I started back in, or it's where my father started back in the uh, early 2000s, end of the 90s, uh, in terms of operating in China. You do direct sales. So you've got your headquarter. You are transacting with China. Either in a variety of different ways, you might be transacting in the form of sourcing in China, you might be transacting in the form of selling into China through wholesalers, through cross-border e-commerce, but you're doing everything direct from your HQ. Okay, also means that goods and inventory are also being shipped direct, or you're purchasing it locally through an intermediary and selling it as well. Okay. But all of the decision-making, all of the transactional deals, all of the revenue is actually being earned in your HQ. There is no right or wrong regarding any of these business models. It all comes down to the risk you are willing to take, whether you are able to win projects based on this type of business model, and the commitment level you have to the Chinese market, okay? And none of these business models are cheap. It is no longer the days and times where we say option one is cheaper than option two or option six is cheaper than option two. No, all of them are expensive, meaning you need to have financial resources to be able to cover any of these options, all right? So option one is the direct sales. Option two is using trade into intermediaries which means using wholesalers, distributors. If you're doing cross-border e-commerce, you're using TPs. So I just want to highlight already with cross-border e-commerce, you're using option one and option two because you have to use intermediaries to fulfill anything that you want to do in the Chinese market, all right? Doesn't have to be trading partners, could be other sorts of partners, but trading partners means that actually the sales agents, the distributors, they're going out and they're acquiring deals for you, inquiries for you, okay? Using trade intermediaries is wonderful. However, I would not put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, Manfred highlighted this yesterday. Uh, when a distributor says they can cater to the enti entire Chinese market, be wary of that statement. Uh, distributors are usually localized in a certain jurisdiction of China and have their network in that 
area. If you have a distributor in Shanghai, usually they will have a network for Zhejiang, Jiangsu province and the Shanghai region. They probably will not have a network for Chongqing and Chengdu, right? So spread your wings, be careful on how you sign these agreements. If there's one tip I can give, and again, I'm not a lawyer, is get a Chinese lawyer to review these contracts. I just had a call last week with a company who was starting their first transaction with a new client in China. And you know nobody had reviewed the agreement. It hadn't even come to their mind to have a Chinese lawyer review the agreement. Use resources locally, okay? Using a UK or US or Australian or German lawyer to review a contract that has to do with a transaction in China will not get you anywhere. They will only protect you from the UK side, but so much could happen from the Chinese side. Get that advisory, right? Um, using trade intermediaries is a great starting point. Even doing direct sales is a great starting point but understand what those limitations are and do consistent reviews. Distributors are not magicians where they are excellent and experts in all areas of marketing, branding, legal tax, and trade, okay? They are not. So evaluate them consistently, okay? You need to be able to understand what are their strengths and what are their weaknesses. You need to be able to do a SWOT analysis on them every six months, every year, and analyze whether you've got to terminate that relationship because it's not going anywhere or find new sales channels. Now, this also goes on to option three and option four, which is using licensees or using franchisees. Option two, option three, option four, it's not really a mix and match of that. It's either you use trade intermediaries, you use licensees, or you use franchisees, depending on the business industry or sector that you are in, okay? And in all of those options, continuously evaluate your trading partners. And do not fear rocking the boat and terminating an agreement because it's not getting you anywhere. All it's doing is giving you anxiety because actually you're not hitting KPIs or sales targets. Uh, and you know you should actually be terminating that relationship and finding somebody new. Now, this leads on to option five, where you start having a type of permanent establishment in market. And it's using an employer of record service. So you're still not committed to having your own entity or subsidiary in China. But you actually realize that the intermediaries that you're utilizing have weaknesses. It's evaluating what those weaknesses are and saying, actually, I'm going to hire somebody who has that strength, which is the weakness of one of these intermediaries, so that I can actually scale and continue to grow. Now, um, this is the step where we get into a gray water, legally speaking. Um, because normally, if you do start hiring people, you should be having a subsidy on your ground to show stability to that employee that you are committed to the market. Using an employer of record service means that you're using an intermediary to hire the individuals legally so that they are legally employed, social insurances, housing funds are all paid for, um, but they are actually behind the scenes working for you full time to be able to grow and scale your business. Christina. Go ahead, Manfred. Now, we, we are having a couple of people here um, who, who kind of, you know, want, want to enter China. Well, what do you think in terms of like having that first employee on the ground? What should be um, available? What, what, what's your checklist where you say at that time you should or you must have the first employee? And maybe before that time, try and work it another way. So... I Sorry always, for the tough question. It is a tough question because it's a balancing act, right? It's about finding that right individual, which is never easy. Uh, wherever you work around the world, it's never easy to find that first hire, okay? Um, so it's, it's having that first hire. But, you know, it could be after six months of having a trade distributor who you can see does not have marketing capabilities or branding capabilities. 
And either you decide I will outsource to a marketing company, which makes total sense to outsource, but then you have to weigh the costs. What is the monthly cost of using a marketing agency or media agency versus a salary of a marketing manager, right? It's evaluating these costs, which all come into the budget. And I hope people are understanding that there's constant evaluation here, right? It's, it's also weighing out the cost of a distributor who says, I want to earn a 10% commission on sales. Well, if somebody says that to me, I'll be like, oh my God, if I open my own subsidiary and do the trade by myself and eliminate this 10% commission, right? Is that going to make my life easier, better? And will I have more control? And I think, I think one point, Christina, I would add, you know, whenever, I mean, China always kind of has that transparency issue, meaning, you know, understanding what's really going on. And the more kind of people you put between yourself and the client, uh, the, the more you kind of, you know, um, escalate lose, actually. Lose the transparency. Yes. Yeah. And if you have kind of that, that, that employee of your own or, or a friend from the past or whatnot, who's kind of doing the stuff, then at least you get the ideas, you know, you also get the, why don't they buy your product or how much too expensive is your product you know, and all these sort of yeah. things. I think that's, I, it's, it's speed really also. So let me, let me also um, re relate this back to yesterday's session on data. Um, you can hire a market research company to do a, a market research analysis for you. Um, I, I am a type of person that does not digest presentations. I, I give a lot of presentations, but I don't digest presentations. I have difficulty reading. Um, I need somebody to tell me actually what I'm learning and, and how I'm understanding it, which is why webinars for me is perfect because I'm hearing, hearing the information. That's how I, I digest data. So I will never ever pay for a market research study because there is no way I'm going to read a 100 page document or go through the, the, the tables of statistics that are there. I won't digest it. I won't do it. Why should I pay for it? For me, the best methodology has been actually hiring somebody to get that data for me who I can communicate on a daily basis with current timing, so not waiting four weeks, five weeks for the data, but every day getting an update on what has been discovered through a 30 minute conversation, it clicks in and then I pivot. I mean, also that's just, how I digest. Just right? one last point here, Christine, and then I, I, I try and kind of uh, tone down my interruptions. Um, what do we also see when you go kind of in the interviews and, and some business leaders do that a lot, you know, by talking to the people and by asking them these questions that you would, you know, want to have addressed with market research, you will definitely learn a lot, a lot. Yes. yes. And obviously, it will also give you a very clear idea of whether you're talking to the right guys or not. Because if you're talking to the wrong guys, you won't be learning the things that you want to learn. Yes. If you're talking to the right sort of people who have the understanding in your niche and in your field, um, you know, maybe you get different sizes of the market, different ideas, but, yeah. you know, you put all that on one sheet, you'll have an idea of what we're really talking about. I also want to emphasize, and not everybody has this budget, but I, I, I talk specifically about a client of mine who does have a budget. They spent 500,000 US dollars uh, on a market research analysis for the f and sector with McKinsey. Okay. Now, 500,000 US dollars, what could I do with that money? Actually, I could hire somebody full-time working on the ground in China who is physically going out, meeting distributors, meeting third parties, right? Go, I mean, that's the salary, that's way less than a monthly salary or, or an annual salary package for somebody who could physically go out on the ground to do the field work. I find that more valuable. Also because there's no way I'm gonna read the report from McKinsey anyhow, unless they present it to me in a one hour conversation, right? So, you know, Manfred, coming back to your question, when is the right time to have that first hire on the ground? For me, it's from day one, but that's just because of how I digest information and how I want to operate. Um, 
other people might say, I would prefer initially to outsource, evaluate, and do it in a phased approach, by all means, you can do that. Okay, mm. there's, there's no doubt. It, it just comes down to your individual preference, your budget, understanding what salary levels are like, and understanding the costs of third parties. Mm -hmm. Right, and making that constant evaluation, where can you save cost at the end of the day? And also, it's a time resource. Uh, and what do I mean by that? It's, um, I would rather have a call every day for 30 minutes or 45 minutes with my team in China uh, to know what is happening every on a 12 hour period, right? Some people just want to delegate. They don't want to be involved on a daily basis or on a weekly basis. They just want to get reports. But I mean, whether they actually read those reports is another question. I want to get daily updates, okay? So again, that comes down to whether your intermediaries are providing those daily updates or not, uh, and whether you, you find it's better. But like I said, you don't have to commit to setting up a subsidiary in China to hire people. What I do want to highlight with option five, though, is if you are based in the UK, the US, basically you're abroad, and you want to hire somebody on the ground, please, please do not go through the methodology of thinking you can hire them from your home jurisdiction. Illegal. If somebody who is mainland Chinese is a resident in mainland China, they are required to pay social insurances, housing fund. And you need to be very careful of permanent establishment regulations. You don't want anybody to denounce you or trigger that actually you have somebody, right, that is being paid from abroad, and then you're triggering permanent establishment regulations. So be very, very weary of that, all right? Worst case scenarios, when you go through these freelance agreements, which are very gray, according to the Chinese regulations, might be fine abroad. In China, it's very gray. Um, uh, you have no right or authority, right? If the employee breaches the contract, nothing you can do. Okay, you might say, well, dust and dusted. If they breach, I just terminate but you don't know what this employee is going to do. Is he gonna denounce you to any of the government offices? It's very easy to do. And if they've lost face, they could. So using an intermediary is also a methodology. This employer record service is a methodology to protect yourself, knowing an individual is hired through a third party, but legally that employment is secure, um, but then working behind the scenes full time for you. Option six, I cannot provide options, option six without giving, because you have to have the full picture of what you can and cannot do in China. Option six is using, I've written Hong Kong, because of course, indirectly, I want to sell my own services. We, our head office is in Hong Kong, but it could be Hong Kong, could be Singapore, um, could be any regional location in Asia. Uh, using a, a location that is easier, uh, governmental wise, uh, as your Asian hub. So I do have clients still to this day who use Hong Kong as their gateway, if you will, or even Singapore as their gateway to China. Now, Hong Kong makes more sense just because of its proximity to China, um, but it depends if you are actually evaluating not just China, but several other Asian regions at the same time for market entry. China is one of the biggest markets in Asia. I get it, but it's not the only market. And you might be analyzing other markets as well. So you could very well say, we start off in Hong Kong, um, start off in Singapore, uh, because it's following the common law system. And from there, we will then move into China, okay? It means you have an entity, but also do not set up Hong Kong or Singapore as just holding structures. If you're gonna do this, make them operational, make sure transactions are running through that entity, make sure even you have your first hires then in Hong Kong. With the pandemic, keep in mind, there is no corridor between Hong Kong, China, Singapore, China. There are still quarantine regulations when you go in and out of each of these jurisdictions. So it's not that that's going to help you in any shape or form. So think of it strategically for the long-term operation of your, of your structure. Then we are getting on to actually having an entity in China, all right? 
Option seven is setting up a representative office. I have to include this, although I hate including it because representative offices are a waste of time, but I need to give you guys the full transparency and picture. Representative offices are liaison offices. They are completely tied to the parent company. All you can do with them is hire people. You cannot utilize that entity for any form of transaction. It is not a revenue generating structure. It is an absolute cost center and you are limited by the functions you can do because in theory, nobody from that office can actually um, negotiate contracts. Um, it is only introduction. You, you're hiring people to do introductions for the HQ, pointless. Nearly all of the representatives offices I've set up in the last 18 years have been converted into limited liability companies. Those that have remained as representative offices are those that are, I mean, the only one that's coming to the top of my head is a Beijing rep office. They sell real estate in Greece and they're trying to attract high net worth Chinese individuals to buy the properties in Greece. Their office, their rep office is a showroom to highlight um, those properties. The transactions are anyway always going to be direct. Okay. So that's the only structure where it actually makes sense. Okay. Option eight is the typical structure that companies will choose to set up a subsidiary in China, which is having your own limited liability company. It is 100% foreign owned, meaning that you're using your home jurisdiction as the shareholder. Uh, that's why it's foreign invested, because it's a foreign sh shareholder. Um, and you are an LLC, you're a limited liability company, and you're liable up to the capital that you have decided to invest in that structure. But you transact, you um, are generating revenue, you can also act as a cost center, all comes down to how you want to formulate your business model, where the transactions will still be direct, whether half of the transactions will be direct and half will be done locally, domestic within China, could be a structure that purchases goods, sells goods, all domestic. Uh, could be that you import goods to sell them domestically. Could be that you are using that entity to export goods, an entity for service, right? We are a service-oriented company in China. Um, there are a lot of options in terms of how you want to structure that business model. Now, if some of you... Uh, did not see. Last week, I did a workshop series all about setting up an entity in China. Um, if you did not participate in that and you would like to see the recordings for that, message me. It was also a four-day workshop purely on how to set up a company in China and what you need to know, the key decisions you have to make. Option nine is setting up a joint venture partnership with a local partner. Now, I just want to highlight for option eight, when, you, when I say 100% foreign-owned, it could be that you have multiple shareholders that are foreigners, okay? So you are setting up a JV, but it's a JV in the structure of many foreign investors. Option nine for me means that you are setting up a joint venture with a local partner, i.e. a mainland Chinese partner. Now, setting up a joint venture structure is a marriage. It's a marriage between a foreigner and a local. You will have cultural differences. You will have differences in how you operate. You need to be very sure on how you're going to formulate this partnership. Who's going to be responsible for what? A lot of joint ventures do not succeed in China. And on the other side of the coin, a lot of joint ventures do succeed in China. There's no magic potion to this. It's the synergy that both partners bring to the operation. And it's also the overview of you evaluate, consistently evaluating that joint venture and if you will, spy on, spying on it, making sure that it's running smoothly, right? Um, be yeah. very... Yeah. Okay. Go, go ahead, Manfred. I think, you know, um, the, the, the joint venture, when we go back a little bit historically, you know, we had certain areas, certain markets, like, for example, the car industry, where we had to have it. And the kind of trick used to be to say, you know, we're Chinese, we're the local ones, we, we get 51% and you can get the rest and bring in the technology. Um, and there's still a lot of areas where it makes a lot of sense. But I think what, what I really want to stress is it needs to make sense, right? Let's not go in and just say, we didn't do our homework, we don't know enough. And because we're not sure, let's get into a joint venture. 
um, if it makes sense, you know, if, if you know that you just can't duplicate the strengths of your partner and you really need them, then, you know, I'm, I'm all good with that. Um, but don't just, don't just marry kind of because you, you, you feel a little bit alone uh, because nobody is kind of joining you at the coffee table. Um, because these sort of joint ventures that I sometimes see, um, I, they then don't make sense because they don't make sense. It's really hard to make sure that the partner is happy. And if you can't make sure that the partner is happy in that sort of joint venture, um, it, it's, it's even more difficult to kind of keep them alive. Mm. And then there's a lot of trouble and, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. And then just to finish off on this, you know, you can always have a mix and match of all of these types of options. So you could, for example, do direct sales, do cross board. Uh, so I'll use a client as an example, okay? They um, started off in China doing cross-border e-commerce, all right? They used a bunch of intermediaries, TPs to do that type of fulfillment, but they were shipping goods, consumer goods direct from their HQ into China whenever orders were placed. As the, what they used as a trigger was the value and the volume of sales that were being generated through the cross-border e-commerce, where they realized actually they wanna start registering their products locally in China through their own structure and through their own subsidiary. So they have now an entity in China. And for those products that are fully registered, they are doing what I call now domestic e-commerce which is on all the local Tmall sites, local JD.com sites, um, not Tmall Global, for example, because that's cross cross border e-commerce. And so they're on the domestic e-commerce site. And now they're actually using wholesalers, so using option two, using trade intermediaries to then sell in, sell in bulk to supermarkets, to small um, 7-Eleven chains, the equivalent of that uh, throughout China. So they're using option one, they're using option two, They've actually set up Hong Kong as their Asian hub, and they have option eight, which is a subsidiary in China. But they did everything in a phased approach, starting off with option one first, right? Moving then to option two, option one plus two, moving then to option one plus two plus six, so then having plus eight as well. So it's a mix and match, right? It, it will be eventually a mix and match of how you actually want to structure your business. But it's very, very important to talk to people to validate your business model and understand in which direction you want to go into. And creating a phased approach to the Chinese market is critical. And there's no length of time for these phases. Phase one could last six months or three months or two years before you hit phase two. What is important is setting triggers. So you know when is the right time to go from phase one to phase two? When is it the right time to go from phase, phase two to phase three? Is it the volume of business? Is it the value of business? Is it the fact that you need to have customer representatives on the ground to support your customers on the ground in the same time zone? Is it the fact that you need to start hiring brand managers um, internally? Is it the fact that you need to suddenly have your own financial analyst on the ground who analyzes the business? These can all be certain triggers. Is it the fact that you have to issue fa piaos now to customers because that's a request? Fa piaos are the official invoices in China when you're transacting. That's also a trigger, right? So there could be many, many triggers where you then have to evaluate, do I now move from phase one to phase two Again, with the idea and the concept that you're building momentum in the Chinese market so that you are continuously scaling and growing. Okay. So these are the business models. Now we're going to lead to a very heavy topic, which is financial resources. And all of you are probably in your mind saying, oh, Christina is going to reveal a magic number. Unfortunately, I'm not. <laughs> there is no magic number when you are going into China, unfortunately. It will come down to what, cap what capabilities you have to spend and what you're willing to spend in the Chinese market, okay? Every single company has different financial needs. In every, in every life cycle, in every phase of their business development. 
What I want to highlight here, and Mary was highlighting it yesterday, when you are in your startup period, you tend to overspend because obstacles come along that you could not have even predicted. For example, the party that you're using translates your name wrongly and you have to start from scratch again. Or uh, regulations have changed and all of a sudden you need all contracts to be re-reviewed. Or um, suddenly your distributor cancels the agreement and you have to find new sales channels. Or the guy that you hired on the ground actually doesn't enjoy working with you and uh, uh, decides to quit after three weeks. So many things could happen that honestly you could not predict, okay? Now, this is where cash flow can be very tight. For me, and I'd be interested to know Manfred's opinion on this. For me, when I look at my clients, a startup period in China is roughly between three to five years until you break even. Manfred? I'm just thinking, I'm just going to the different categories of kind of clients that I have, because very often we have clients, you know, that um, they start, just like you said, they, they use a mixed approach where they start with an intermediary and then kind of they set up their own thing. Um, if you do it that way, um, I think it, it, it can be a little bit faster, but again, you know, it really depends on how, how fast you move, meaning you go in, you do everything organical, which is kind of the, the, the SME or the family companies approach, um, is very different as opposed to you go in, you build up a large team, a really good team, and then you move really fast. And so I think it, it, it depends on that. But um, I actually wouldn't kind of want to make it much more than three years from a plan perspective. Because as you said, you know, there's so many things that will happen. The only thing that I kind of want to stress with, with liquidity, especially now everywhere in the world, but always in China, you know, keep in, keep in mind that people will pay later in one way or the other. So, you know, you don't just send out the bills and they're being paid. Um, don't expect that. It will be different. Um, and from that perspective, you know, I'm, I'm just saying in China, really much more so than anywhere else, cash or in that matter, liquidity is king. Absolutely. There's no liquidity. Cash, cash is king. Water. Cash is king. You're dead in the water. Yeah. And this is, this is the key during the startup phase. All right. Financial planning is a necessity to avoid any cash flow issues, okay? Um, and I just want to even highlight, you always need to have a backup plan in terms of how can you get cash into the country. Silly things like not even creating a sound foundation where suddenly your bank in China says we are freezing your accounts because you haven't updated your registered office address. Meaning for three months, you don't have access to your bank account because you're going through a bureaucratic procedure. And for three months, you can't pay salaries, you can't pay rent, you can't pay providers, you can't do anything. So even if you do have a subsidy on the ground and you do have a bank account, but you're not following regulations because you think you can get, you are, you are the one who can get away with it, which was the case of this one client, um, you can get truly stuck. Financial planning in China is also something where, even though you do create a budget, my biggest tip would be get it validated by somebody in China who understands what a PL looks like, who can evaluate what your tax liabilities would look like, who can evaluate whether you have calculated social insurance housing funds correctly, just to make sure that you're really crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Now, running out of cash in China can have serious consequences for your business. It's missed opportunities, meaning you're not honoring deals with suppliers, with third-party agents, logistical providers. You might not be able to arrange deliveries on time, and you might not be able to clear customs 
uh, pay customs duties, pay the necessary VATs if you're importing into China. On top of that comes then salaries, rent. I mean, you are not portraying a state, you're, you're not portraying yourself as a stable organization within China. And what you don't want to happen in the first three to five years of your operation is that parties take legal action against you, right? Because everybody is strapped for cash. Christina, can I add something here? Yes, please do. Um, I mean, for, for those that maybe have not been um, looking into China so much yet, um, you, you might or might not be familiar with the fact that you just can't easily send money into China or out of China. There is very tight uh, financial regulations for these money streams, um, which really means that, you know, you've set up a company and there's two less registered capital. You don't just make this because you have the money in Europe and you wire it in and everything's good. Exactly because of this issue, Christina is, is stressing the point so much you need to do more thinking ahead so that you are then prepared when the stuff has happened that we all kind of prayed for would never happen. I mean, you know, uh, one thing that I, I highlight is, uh, you know, uh, April, May and half of June, um, I had zero visibility over my own bank account during the Shanghai lockdowns because nobody could go to the offices. And unfortunately, systems are still quite old fashioned, particularly with banks that I had no clarity of any inbound payments, i.e. payments from abroad, zero, zero overview, zero clarity for two and a half months, okay? The goal for me with my clients during that period was doing daily cash flow analyses to understand how they could survive during this two and a half month period of continuously paying rent and wages, because even though they couldn't go to the office, you still have to pay rent. Um, even though your staff are not really working, you still have to pay salaries, right? You still have to continue your operations. Your goods are still stuck at warehouse, uh, at the warehouses, so you still have to pay warehousing fees, right? This still all has to happen, and you still need to have cash on the ground to support that. So it is vital um, that you do it. And as for high do not some of you might say what with foreign invested companies in China those are usually the worst payers just saying uh, the trend has been actually that these are have become some of the worst payers compared to state-owned companies or Chinese domestic companies even if you have a payment term of 90 days 180 days doesn't mean that people pay you on time Okay. And as Manfred also highlighted, financing your business in China is slower. It is more difficult. There are restrictions on money flowing into China, money flowing out of China. Restrictions is probably too strong of a word. There are bureaucratic procedures that you have to go through that are extremely old fashioned to be able to get money into your bank account in China and out of your bank account in China. Domestic business is not an issue. This can be done through online banking, piece of cake. The, the domestic business of money coming in from domestic companies and going out to domestic companies is really not, not a problem. It's really the inbound and outbound of funds where there are, again, I, I, I hate to use the word restrictions because restrictions was 20 years ago. Nowadays, it's more bureaucratic processes and procedures that you have to go through. Um, when companies go into China, if you choose the business model of transacting directly from abroad, from your HQ, my biggest recommendation would be to discuss with your HQ finance team to have a separate China PL from day one so that you can analyze from day one the revenue you're earning and the costs associated with that revenue. And that means that if you have built a team of one or two people that are China-centric in your HQ, those salaries need to go in that P&L so you can truly evaluate what is the status of your business. If you have not done that yet and you're already transacting with China, it's never too late. 
please discuss with your finance team about creating that separate P&L so you can really analyze your China business. Because that should be a trigger for you to understand how to go from one phase to the next phase to the next phase. When you have your, subs and, and mind you, it's common sense, but if your finance team makes the effort to do that, please analyze it. Just because they do it and make a beautiful report doesn't mean you should, be, should not be looking at it and analyzing it and saying, okay, how do we evaluate the business now and where do we go from here? Christina? Um, I've, I've stressed it here yesterday and I'm happy to, to do the same thing again. For any guys of you out there who are already in China, who already have numbers pouring back, you know, be that because you already have a sales guy, be that because you have an entity, be that because um, you just started. Do think about taking Christina up uh, on her experience and capacity in that domain to kind of, you know, look at your financial numbers to understand because at the end of the day you know you want to scale in a lean way you don't want to grow fat first from a cost perspective and then kind of try to scale you know use the early days to change change processes change cost structures change procedures and so on and so forth um and and, and that's really where i would appreciate or not appreciate suggest kind of uh, talking to Christina because she sees the numbers and then she kind of understands what's going on. Um, and that is tremendously helpful because the people at the HQ will not be able to help you. Um, you'll need somebody kind of with that perspective from over there, from on the ground to kind of see what's what's going on and what should be changed. And if you if you do have an entity in China, then prior to establishing that entity, make sure you are analyzing the financial needs of that operation, okay? Um, Manfred used the term registered capital. Uh, so when you set up your entity in China, you will need to designate a register, registered capital amount. This is your working capital, meaning that you are using these funds to start up your business. A lot of people have the mindset, we'll make that the lowest possible so that we have no risks. That is pointless because you need to use that money to pay your expenses locally, to transact locally, et cetera. It has to be a reasonable amount. Um, if you want to have a magic number or a magic formula, usually I would say calculate your year one and year two costs and put that as your registered capital amount, okay? Uh, with the thought that you know, you're going to have delays in payments. So even though you're going to be revenue generating, it's going to take time to, to get that money in from clients. Do consistent cash flow projections. Um, and just remember that once that number is put, that is what has to go into the account. Um, reflect back on next last week's workshop series. I go into depth on this on one session. Um, what I want to highlight is finance financing options in China because there are certain restrictions. It's not just that you can suddenly say, oh, my HQ is going to now give a loan of 100,000 and we'll click the button and it will be in the account tomorrow. No, that's not happening at all. Anytime that you want money um, in the form of capital, foreign debt loan, or any form of debt financing, you need to calculate a period of six to eight weeks just to go through the bureaucratic procedure. So option one in terms of financing is the registered capital. This is if you have a subsidiary in China. Um, option two is your foreign debt loan, which is the difference between your designated registered capital and the total investment for the project. There is a ratio between the two. Um, and that foreign debt loan will come in. And that's the only form of loan that can come in from the shareholder. And option three has to come from the shareholder. Option three is debt financing, meaning that you apply for loans domestically in China or you do, uh, apply for loans uh, from your banks abroad in terms of being able to fund the operation. But of course, the downside to that is the interest rates that are skyrocketing at the moment, right? So there's always going to be a, a downside to option three. And option four to get money much faster than option one, two, and three is to have service agreements in place between your HQ or your subsidiaries, wherever they are, that have a cash pool available and your China operation. Um, China is 
rendering services, issues an invoice to whichever entity or structure to get funding. Whenever you have these types of transactional services, there is VAT applicable. You need to be aware of that. And you need to go through an evaluation process of what is the best methodology, right? Is it option one? Is it option two, option three, or option four? Again, no right or wrong here. It really comes down to your business, your business needs, how much capital do you need, et cetera. You can, of course, always increase your registered capital. Um, not an issue. You simultaneously increase your liability. So you just need to weigh out the pros and cons around that. Now, how to set up and maintain a budget for your China operations. People usually get stuck, stuck on starting, just very simply starting. There are four things that I would recommend. The first two are the easiest, in my opinion. Calculate your costs. Um, cost of goods, cost of services. Evaluate, talk to logistics providers, talk to warehousing providers, talk to uh, packaging providers um, uh, about their fees. How much is the estimate of what their monthly fees might be depending on the volume of business that's going through? Now, step two, calculating your expenses. This is a benchmarking. Evaluate rent, rental prices evaluate salary. So this is something, again, when it comes to headcount, talk to Manfred. Talk about what are the salary guidelines right now for different roles. Talk about social insurance and housing fund um, implications. What is the total cost going to be for you for certain people in certain roles and positions? Okay. Very easy to do. Talk to the headhunters. They're the experts. And this is where Manfred's expertise comes into play. Um, talk to, when you talk about expenses, talk to media agencies, make a comparison, talk to three, four different providers. Um, estimate travel costs and expenses. But, you know, another thing is, is traveling really a necessity nowadays or can still things be done by Zoom and over video conference calls or WeChat calls? Calculating your expenses is easy because you're really relying on third parties to give you quotations. And it's a matter of then plugging those numbers in and, and making estimates around that. For me, estimating revenue is tricky, always tricky. Obviously, if you've got historical data, it makes life easier, right? And especially when you have an idea on strategy, what new sales channels you're going to add in or talking to existing customers, are they going to buy more from you? Are they going to buy differently from you? I always get the impression, and, and Manfred was talking about this yesterday, but I didn't interject on it, and I want to talk about it now, is for some reason, people don't talk with each other. The lack of communication is unreal. How can you also acquire data if you don't talk? So you have already a pipeline of customers. I mean, speak to them, right? Uh, you speak to your customers in Europe, you speak to your customers in the UK, you try to understand how their business is developing, you'll get an inclination of whether they're going to buy more from you or not, you'll get an understanding of what's going on with them. Why don't you do that with China? Is it a language barrier? And if it is a language barrier, then fix it. Hire somebody locally who can have those conversations with your customers and get more data and information. Right? But if you don't speak to your customers, your existing customers or new customers about trends and developments, how can you estimate your revenue? Right? Then step four is reviewing your cash flow for your China operations. And like this, start simple. Okay? Basic costs, basic expenses, revenue coming in. Right? What, what does that look like on a month to month? basis. And you have to look at that probably weekly to reevaluate every time money comes in. And if you are right now in the stage of doing things from your HQ, this is where it becomes vital for your finance team to keep a separate P&L balance sheet cash flow statement just for your China operations. Can I, can I add two points, Christina? Please do. Um, let, me, let me kind of um, start off on your key point. Um, I think what's important in those, when you start, is you know that that iterative thought and that iterative process and kind of using essentially your bank account and what goes in and what goes out to learn and understand. Because 
that is a very, I mean, I talked yesterday a lot about understanding local reality. You know, that is a very good data point that everybody has. And if you don't understand something, you know, go ask, go, go question. Because the better your understanding of that local reality, the better you will actually be able to, to grow that business. Um, and I think- and, 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 and never have a fear of asking the, the dumb questions. Ask the dumb questions. For sure. Right? You know, if you don't understand, for example, VAT, I've been working with my brother for over 20 years. He still doesn't understand VAT in China and I have to reiterate it to him constantly. But he needs clarity and transparency. So if you have to ask a question a hundred times, ask it a hundred times. And, and I think kind of coming back to that iterative thought, you know, um, time is very precious for all of us. Um, and still I agree with Christina kind of to say, you know, try and look at the cash flow each week. Um, because it's not just looking at it, you know, it's also asking the questions, it's getting the answers, it's, you need that time to actually learn. Um, if you only do it once a month, and you only do it kind of for an hour, then you spend 45 minutes looking at it, you've got no kind of time for the questions and the answers. And then every now and then that gets kind of cancelled out. So that is the first point I wanted to make, you know, use it as an iterative learning tool. And the second part of that message is kind of, you know, also, then adapt. You learn something new. So you either you need to change your budget for the future because you understood that whatever the taxi costs are three times as high as you've kind of planned them for, or there will be five times as many business travels, that sort of thing, you know, adapt. Um, but at the same time, you know, kind of double check with your processes. Like Christina said, is it necessary? And does it make sense kind of to still do as much business traveling as we did three years ago before Corona, you need to decide for yourself. I'm not the guy who says it's either or, but I'm the guy who says, you know, I'm sure you can save a couple of trips. And, and, and that is something where, you know, it's, it's also about setting the tone with your team. It's about establishing the sort of culture. And that is something is very easy because you have that data. You know, when you just go to your team member and say, you know, you should be traveling a little bit less, well, you know, it's 8,000 kilometers distance. Um, maybe they hear you, maybe they don't. Mm -hmm. So that was the first point I wanted to make. And the second point is really in terms of the, in the salaries because Christina raised that point. Um, I, I often get a lot of surprise, you know, when people see the numbers that people cost these days in China. Put differently, if you want a good person, you know, it's at least the European salary. If you want a good person in Shanghai, it will be more than the European salary. Um, and I think that is something that you need to pay attention to. You know, Like Christina said, none of these options are either for free or cheap. So you need to have the understanding that this really makes sense. But then if it is a strategic market for something really big, then most likely there will be a way to get the funds. But you know, the, again, you know, don't 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 come rolling and say, you know, oh, I thought, you know, we can hire these people for twenty thousand euros or twenty thousand pounds. Uh, those days are long, 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 long gone. Um, and that is something you you need to consider. You know, it's not just about kind of the headhunter or the external costs. It's again, it, it's a cash flow issue. You need to be paying these people, you know, monthly. You need to establish trust with your team. If you don't trust your team, why should they be giving their best for you? They won't. And, and that is important, you know, that is important in cash to have it, to pay them. But it's also important upfront to understand that. I see then companies who keep, you know, tracking back and instead of taking a really good guy, taking a really weak one. Mm. Okay. The question in sales is always, you know, is it an investment or are you throwing money out of the window? You know, you, you obviously you can hire people for as low as 200,000 RMB. The question is just what are you doing with them? Why are you paying them? You know, and, and that's kind of something that you need to look at in your cash flow projections or in your financial projections, because obviously, if you hire sales guys, they need to bring in certain numbers. If they don't bring in certain numbers, no matter what they explain, no matter how much they tell you that China is so, 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 so different, you will need to make a decision, right? You can't just keep them feeding forever because they keep telling you that the sales cycle in China is four times as long as it is in Europe. Most likely it isn't. 
Back to you, Christina. Food for thought. All right, to finish off today, just the golden rule around financing. Um, stay conservative. Uh, be prepared for the worst. Highball your expenses and be prepared for low sales initially. It will take time to generate revenue and to get the actual physically actually get that money in the account, especially if you're looking to generate revenue in China. All right. Highball your expenses initially. Eventually it will plateau yourself. It will plateau out um, over time. Okay. But again, stay conservative. Um, and again, I can't emphasize more, you know, if it's not with me, please do it with somebody, get your budgets validated, not just by your CFOs abroad, but by people that are on the ground in China that do this for a living, get them just validated. You know, the whole point of us on the ground is to be able to say to you, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? From an operational perspective, have you thought of this? We are doing it on a day-to-day -day basis, right? This is going to give you the security you need to know that when you click that, that, red, um, that green button to execute, you are on the right track in terms of your financial status. And CFOs and the HQs are pains in the butt. Actually, any member of the finance team is usually the enemy. Why? Because they are there to protect the business. It's logical, guys, right? They are there to make sure there's enough cash in the bank account, there's enough profit to make everybody happy, whether it's board of directors, whether it's other types of investors. So they are going to be your financial controlling arm. Now, for some reason, when people kick off their China projects, somehow, I think it's because so many opportunities suddenly fall on the doorstep and everybody wants to grab at every single opportunity that somehow they lose this financial controlling piece. Make sure you have somebody who is acting as the financial controller, as the enemy. Okay, I say that because otherwise you will, pardon my language, be screwed during your startup phase. All right, you need somebody to act as that enemy. You need somebody who sits there and says, why are you spending money on this? Why are you doing that? you need somebody to be that pain in the butt to evaluate whether the decisions that are being made are the correct decisions for the company and whether you have enough funding to survive in case of worst case scenarios, right? The financial analyst and controller is there to actually foresee and forecast scenarios, whether it's economic, geopolitical, just general life trends. Um, they are there to protect the business. Do not see them as the enemy. They are there to actually protect the business. And, and make sure that you incorporate that in, in kind of in your startup team, right? Yes. Don't, don't just look at it from a startup perspective or from the sales perspective. And then kind of, you know, you keep, you keep the, the, the ball rolling. And then kind of when you're actually hitting the problem, you bring them in. Bring them in beforehand and give them the task to look out, you know, on the next six months because that that task is important you know somebody needs to be there while you're still part and, and this can be somebody from the hq can be somebody local this is completely up to you as long as they've got a financial background and they're actually reading the management reports that are coming through okay um but it is something that i, I want people to place more emphasis also let's now relate this to yesterday's session financial management reports are the first piece of data that you have on your China business. All right, the first piece of data. Before you start looking at market segmentation reports and brand awareness reports and uh, benchmarking reports, price, price benchmarking and all of these types of things, okay? So be conservative. Now, Manfred and I wanted to end uh, today's discussion, um, and I, I, Manfred's been tracking all the questions that have been popping in, but uh, Manfred and I wanted to have a bit of a discussion about the challenges of running an operation in China and to raise certain solutions um, to counter them, right? Because uh, again, we, I've gone through this myself, and uh, if I would have had a heads up, it would have been very helpful.
Mm -hmm. uh, Manfred, do you want to kick off? Just about just about challenges, right? Um, that are out there, or uh, did you already raise a question? Sorry, I just kind of put in a comment while you were speaking. Sorry. I think. Look, I think um, there is there is a lot of challenges, especially especially when you're starting. I guess a lot of this kind of really will be, you know, the intensity of the experience. You take a single element, you know, everybody says, come on, you know, that's that's obvious, you know, you, you just know that. People do know, you know, people that kind of, you know, have blown really big holes into their corporates in China. They're not people who are not smart. I think it's just as soon as you're on the roller coaster in China, a lot of things are, 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 are kind of happening uh, at once. That's, that's what I see times again and again and again and again. And, and I think this is where we need to be a little bit careful. And I think this is where we need to be a little bit challenged to understand that uh, people are overloaded, maybe at 120% capacity, 150% capacity or 200%. And, and we need to kind of find some safety nets for that. I would say probably one of uh, the biggest challenges, and I'm saying it because this has just popped up last Friday, is the relationship between the HQ and the China operation. If there is no cooperation, collaboration, and open communication, I, I didn't realize there were the three Cs, um, then that's the first step of challenges arising. I have a trading client who suddenly placed an order for goods to be delivered to China and the order got blocked by HQ because of internal political drama. Okay, meaning that my client doesn't have enough inventory and might not have enough inventory to start off 2023, which will impact sales. You don't have the product, how do you sell? right? Might impact the Chinese New Year period as well. So, and you might all say, oh, that's not us. Trust me, it is everybody. Every single company I have collaborated with has had communication issues between HQ and the China operation. Not one has had, has had smooth sailing. And I would even go further. It's, you know, the communication is kind of the tip of the iceberg. What's beneath, what's the one that's sinking the Titanic, is trust issues. Yes. People don't trust their own colleagues in China. Or put differently, people don't trust their Chinese colleagues. And I think that is something that you need to be very sensitive about, very much aware about. And that is as whoever who's kind of, you know, driving this project must be one of your key responsibilities to establish trust. There's an old Chinese saying which goes, ren bu yong, yong ren bu yi, which really means that, you know, um, if you don't trust the people, you do not anymore keep on employing them. So you need to have trust with your team, right? Because you, you want somebody to build that kind of thing in China, your big business, um, and chances are high that, you know, it's, it's about knowledge, it's about teaching them things. You know, people don't teach if you don't trust each other. Mm. Um, and that is something that is extremely important and, and that directly leads to better communication. The more I trust Christina, the more I tell her. The less I trust Christina, uh, the, the less I will tell her. Exactly. And I think there's also the issue of uh, expectations, the expectations that the Chinese China team has for the HQ and the expectations that the HQ has from the China team. Uh, a lot of it stems from communication. There is not enough talking one with each other. Um, one, when, when I have clients who work with Woodburn, one of the fundamental requests from Woodburn is that every single month, we have a phone call between Finance HQ, GM Finance China, and us. 
it's us instigating the bridge coming together so that everybody has a clear understanding of the status today of the company, what is happening in the future, and everybody is speaking. I guess you could say we are the mediators, but sometimes you need a mediator to come in to help with the communication and help with the uh, bridge uh, staying strong and staying, staying complete. Um, and my job is just finance. I, I don't talk about the actual operations of the business, but this is where you have to think logically, how are you gonna communicate? How will you trust? And it's not just with your team, it's also with third parties. Communicating with your distributors, communicating with TPs, with logistics providers, media agencies, headhunters, lawyers, whomever, right? You're gonna have an ecosystem of people on the ground that are gonna support your business. How do you communicate with them? Do you communicate enough with them? And this is where, you know, we're talking about data resources, we're talking about financial resources, and now we're talking about time resources. You need people in the HQ that have the time available to really focus on the China startup and the China operation so that everybody is on the same page. Otherwise, it's just wanna, not going to work. I want to I wanna revisit this topic of expectations, you know. Um, earlier on, you had that analogy about the JV being a marriage. And obviously, there are expectations from the husband to his wife and, and vice versa. If you have an employee in China, I wouldn't really see it as a marriage, but still that expectations topic is immensely important. It's immensely important. You manage to set too high expectations in the recruitment process, and you manage then day by day, week by week to break these expectations, you will soon not be having an employee anymore in China. So there's two things I kind of wanna, wanna stress. The first thing is, what can this employee expect from you? Be very realistic about this. Maybe even to use the word blunt. You know, if you've got stuff to hide, before you hire him is the time to pull it out in the open. Why? They will find out. And when they will find out and when they will be really disappointed, they will leave. It's not Chinese. That's human. You know, that, that goes for Germans as well as UK, as well as USA, as well as China and Japan. Same stuff everywhere. But, you know, make sure you do. The first thing. The second thing is, you know, have realistic expectations towards your team. You know, we, we as humans, all of us have this kind of flaw that in terms of short term, the expectations is too high and then kind of over the long period, it's too low. You know, don't, don't, don't have that kind of curve where you say we bring him in and in the first nine months, he needs to achieve all of that. You know, use a more reasonable three year perspective. Look at three years, look at what needs to be done, you know. Yes, China can be a sprint from time to time, but in all fairness, it really is a marathon. You know, you, you need to keep on going. You need to keep on going. And kind of, how does that translate to starting? It really means like when you hire that person or when you kind of retain any sort of partner in China, you know, you need to have in a certain way written expectations. Expectations that can then be revisited either in a conversation or when you do a review session to kind of see and to change and to adapt. And that is extremely important, A, to have them, and B, to have them in a sort of, you know, realistic way, because if you expect too much from people, then they'll also be quitting. You know, you, you, you need to get it right in a sense and what can be achieved within a year and within two years. And that is extremely important then as the foundation for your, for your further success. Another, another challenge I just want to highlight before we finish off today, because we have run out of time, is foundation. The foundation of your operation in China. Um, the, the, uh, the biggest mistake that happened to me back in 2003 when we set up our subsidiary in China was not creating the right foundation for the business. Making too many assumptions, um, relating a lot, thinking that Hong Kong was like China, totally different um, and me spending and I was on the ground in Shanghai me spending over 50 percent of my time on administrative measures and fixing things versus actually looking at the growth and the scale of, of the company I lost five years 
every time I was taking one step forward with growth, I had to take three steps back because there was something that was not fixed within our business license, the structure, not the right fit for the people, et cetera. So really when, and we're gonna to touch on this on tomorrow's session about developing your ecosystem, evaluating partners who are going to be there to support your business. These partners are all people. Um, some of them you just won't click with, Other, others you might click very well with. It's evaluating them and then having a backup. Um, I have a lawyer, I've had him for quite a while. He's on my speed dial. Um, I really like him. I collaborate well with him. He, he answers my questions straight away. But I also have a backup of two other lawyers just in case this one doesn't pan out, right? It's having that ecosystem readily available at your fingertips so that when you do hit an obstacle, and we all do, I, I still do after 20 years hit obstacles, um, it's having this uh, ecosystem readily available not just one person, multiple people that you can constantly switch and change providers. Again, and, it's about pivoting very quickly. And again, you know, all, all of us are hitting obstacles in China. That's not the point. The point really is, as always in life, how do you respond to it, right? And if you have trusted partners, the, the word is not to have partners. The word is to have trusted and proven partners. That's what you want. Yeah. Um, because that's what you will also need. Just kind of, you know, having, having the worst challenge in your kind of business life career in China and then kind of, um, so to speak, to test someone, that's not the right time to test someone. You know, when that happens, it'd be great if you already have a couple of trusted and proven ones. So get to know them early on, you know, test them with kind of small stuff, small tasks. See. Use your market entry for this evaluation, actually, in the end. Exactly. Right. And I, I do want to say, um, again, in last week's workshop series, I, I finished off the series talking about the value ladder. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll add it into, into tomorrow's session. Um, I created a value ladder on how I actually, how my team and I should be evaluating partners. And, um, um, and my philosophy is I want to work with partners that want to build my business with me. Their KPI and their goal and objective is to make sure that I grow and scale, just like my objective is to grow and scale. However, there are the majority of partners on the ground in China who are there where you can just delegate. And they do it for you, meaning they'll do the work, but there's no, uh, there's, there's not this partnership, if you will. Right, You're delegating media content to a media agency, but actually you're not discussing with each other. You're not evaluating together what is the right media content. Should we update something? Was something written wrongly in the past? Again, this, this communication aspect of the media agency should be wanting to create media for you for the long term and building that content with, with you based on, because nobody knows the philosophy of your company better than you do, right? So for me, that is, is uh, uh, I'll, I'll try and add that tomorrow as well, but I hope to not make it too long. Um, let's finish off there because we have run out of time. Um, I haven't looked at all the comments in the chat box. I don't know if there are questions that have popped in. Manfred, is there anything in the chat box? All good for the time being. All, all good? good? Okay. Manfred and I have one more China strategy session available. Um, if anybody is interested in this, email. You can email me or Manfred or both. Um, you can take a screenshot of this if you like. So you've got our email addresses available um, and we can, we can fit you in for that, that session. And tomorrow we're going to be talking about building an empowering ecosystem of people who, again, are going to be there to support your business on the ground. Um, and then session four is a live Q&A about what will be the next three action points that people take in the next 90 days. So I hope to see you all there. Thank you very much for staying with us and for running out of time. Uh, we Thank appreciate you so much, it. everybody, for your time. And we're looking forward to be seeing you again tomorrow. Exactly. And, uh, and take care. You. Bye.